Well, this morning we have a few announcements, more than normal. So I'm just going to run down these very quickly. Our first announcement is you have some information in your bulletin, a full-size sheet of paper, and then also this half-size sheet of paper. Uh, both of those are talking about uh, Life Cares United. They are a nonprofit located in Fargo. One of our organizations that often meets in our church, Moms Demand Action, they have already partnered with Life Cares United Foundation um, for, for various activities. And our Sunday School program has decided also to partner with them for Christmas. So you can read about what we're doing on this sheet, and on the big sheet, you can read more about Life Care Unites Foundation. That's the first announcement. The second announcement is that today after church, we're going to be having hanging of the greens, basically getting our house ready for Christmas right here. And uh, you are welcome to join us, three o'clock. Um, there's a bunch of activities, well, work activities of hanging greens and putting Christmas trees up and things like that. So wonderful, fun things to do. Uh, the third announcement is that as we have been normally doing, we are informally, right in the beginning of worship, asking for volunteers to read scripture, do the call to worship, and today, light the very first candle in the countdown candle. I think you might know this as the, as the Advent wreath lighting candle. Because of Leander, we have changed the name. This year, we're going to count it, or we're going to call it the countdown candle, because basically, this is the countdown to Christmas candle. So there are three volunteer opportunities for anyone here today. If you would like to come up and light the countdown candle, and I'll tell you when that time is, there's a card that you'll be reading and the candle that you'll be lighting from. The second volunteer announcement will be for call to worship, and the third volunteer opportunity will be reading of the scripture. So, is there anyone who wants to do the first volunteering? Lighting the count, you want to do it? Okay, and does your mom want to? She can. Um, who would like to volunteer with Leander to read the card? Do you okay? Are you okay if you volunteer with Chris? Raise your hand, Chris. Okay, you, the two of you will do it together. It'll be awesome, okay? I'll point to you when we're ready. We're not ready yet, okay? <laughs> we have one more announcement from the Memorial Committee. Okay. Good morning. My name is Enika Justitz, and I'm on the Memorial Committee together with Dagny Forbes and Eric Sweet. One of the functions of the Memorial Committee is to assist donors who wish to donate to the Memorial Fund in memory of a loved one or in honor of a special person. Together with the pastor and the session, and the session is an elected board representing the congregation, the committee also identifies items, projects, um, programs that may be funded with such memorial donations. Last year, the committee wrote a new memorial policy, which is online, you can read it, which includes the creation of a wish list, a wish list of items that the memorial committee might fund. We would like your input as to what to include on this wish list. So at the end of the service today, we're handing out a questionnaire with a bit more information about the Memorial Committee and the process, and we're asking you to add your ideas to the list uh, on this form and to rank the entries as to their importance to you and the mission of the church. And then you may put the completed questionnaires, and it doesn't have to be today. You can take your time um, in a box on the table in the narthex that is marked Memorial uh, Committee. 
So you would really help us if you could give us your ideas. There is space for comments and questions. And if you could do this in the next week or two, that would be awesome. Thank you. Leander, are you ready? Chris, are you ready? OK. OK, Leander, you come up right over here. I'm going to give you this. Now, you wait. You stand right up here for right now. Chris is going to read something, OK? You can stand right there. Listen to these words from the prophet okay. Isaiah. Can you reach that? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. May the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whose light is coming into the world, be with each and every one of you. Please share the peace of Christ with many of the neighbors around you. Now that we have shared the peace of Christ with many of the people who surround us in this beautiful sanctuary, is there a volunteer who would like to lead the congregation in the call to worship? As darkness, oh, sorry, rise for the call to worship. <laughs> as darkness descends on our northern lands, as the sun rises later and disappears sooner, as cold air brushes our cheeks and chills our hands, our, our ingenious sighs and motivation wanes, as we lose sight of what really matters and why we are on this planet and what we want to do with our life, we must remember that God instilled in each of us a unique goal for our life and gave us unique skills and personality traits to be able to achieve those goals. We must remember that now is the time for us to wake up from sleep, and now is the time to see God at work in our life, just like Mary woke up to find an angel giving her great news.
As we uh, go through Advent, as we begin Advent right now, as we begin the countdown to Christmas, one thing that you're going to notice is that the music for Advent is incredibly somber. Even though all of us, especially if we go to the mall, will feel like we're in Christmas, we're not in Christmas yet, we're in Advent. There's a plaintiveness to the Advent season. We pretend as if the light of Jesus is not yet in the world. We work through the anticipation for the joy of Christmas. And that's why our music will have the plaintive quality and gradually become more joyful as we get closer and closer to the day that Jesus was born. Confession is a lot similar to that especially those times in our life when we truly feel sinful for something we've said, truly feel sinful for something we've done, truly feel sinful when we make a rash mistake or even carefully planned what we will say to someone to hurt them most. There's a plentiveness when we come into confession And after much work, there's a joy when we truly feel forgiven. The spirit of Advent, let us read our confession of sin as printed in your bulletin. O God, help me to remember that you gave skills to achieve them. Help me see through the period of Help me rise above my weakness my temporary despair, and above everything hold me back. Oh God, help me to live beyond the sin in my life. It keeps me in darkness. Show me just a brief glimpse of your Christmas light. Hear my silent confession of sin. The sin of the entire world is not too much for Jesus. And therefore, your one, the sin of just you is definitely not too much for Jesus. Through the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all of our sins are forgiven. Please rise. Are there any kids out there who want to have a story read to them? Wow. Hmm. Well, your tennis shoes almost look kind of retro. I like them. Okay. We're going to read a story here. Are you going to come on up, Charlotte? Not all come. It's going to be a pretty good story. But But I have to warn you, do you see what the title says? Be ready for God's surprise. Be ready for many surprises while I read this, okay? So just be ready. Raise your hand if you're ready for surprises. 
Okay, Max, when you're ready for surprises. Okay, Charlotte, we're, we'll see what happens here. Okay, here we go. Sitting near the Jesus his disciples, James and Peter, blah! <laughs> Do you ever worry? <laughs> well, they nodded, yes, we worry. Well, Jesus comforted them. Everyone, wah! Everyone worries, but remember that God is in charge. You don't have to worry. I won't always be with you, Jesus continued, but remember, God is in charge no matter what happens. You weren't scared on that one? You were? Okay. Well, the disciples asked Jesus, where are you going? Jesus hugged his friends and he said, I am going to be with my Father in heaven. I will come back. <laughs> and then we will all be together, you, me, God, and all our friends. How long will you have to wait? Or how long will we have to wait for you to come back? Peter asked. You want to see the picture? They're in kind of, it's called the temple. It's kind of like a church. See that back here? Kind of looks like a temple or it looks like a church, like church windows kind of. And then here are the three people. Which one do you think is Jesus? This one, this one, or this one? Yeah, that's right. This is Jesus. And then the other one, I guess, is Peter. And then there's a James. Ah! Nobody knows exactly when I might come back, Jesus answered. Well, this response confused the disciples. You don't know, they said to Jesus. And Jesus explained, in springtime, trees show little, green leaves. In summer, the leaves grow big. What happens in fall and in winter? Well, they change color and they fall. The leaves on the tree may change many, 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 many times before I come back. Heaven and earth will weigh and change just like those leaves, but my promises to you will never change. You can trust what I say. The disciples tried not to worry, but they didn't want Jesus to come on to leave. My return is God's surprise. It might be when you're sleeping or when you're playing outside or when you're very old or very young. But Jesus says to them, I promise that I will return. I love you even when you can't see me. Be ready for God's surprise. Did you know when I was going to make a loud noise every time? Or was it? Were you surprised the very first time? Okay, so we were super surprised the first time. How about you, Max? And was this kind of scary every time I would do that? Because you didn't know when I was going to do it? Oh, it's kind of fun though, wasn't it? Okay. Do you ever worry about anything that you can't control? Like, if you worry about a test, well, you can control that because you could maybe do some of your homework and get ready for the test. But what would happen if... The teacher gave you a surprise test. You wouldn't be ready, and it's a surprise. And sometimes life throws us many surprises, but here's the really cool thing. We can trust that even when there's a surprise, we don't have to worry because God's going to be with you every time there's a surprise. Every time there's a surprise, are you going to, are you, what do you think, do you think I'll do it again? Hmm, maybe I'll surprise you. You don't have to worry because God will be with you through all the surprises. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being with me in all the Surprises. Amen. You can go back to your pews now. But watch out! <laughs>
All right, now here's the last surprise for the congregation. Who would like to come up and read the, um, uh, the scripture passage from Isaiah? Um, it's right here printed in big, bold font or from your pew Bible. Nadine, thank you. <laughs> All right, the reading for today is Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. The future house of God. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people Peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. It's right. I guess none of us can control the future, even when there might be a surprise. Although I promise you, in the adult sermon, I will not be shouting or doing any surprises. Is that a good? Who said good? Who said good? Someone, someone said good. A few said, said good. All right. Uh, our, our last reading, um, you'll notice uh, from the bulletin uh, that even though we're only reading two scriptures, every Sunday we have three scriptures in the bulletin. The call to worship is always most often based on a scripture passage as well. And uh, for all of Advent and into Christmas, uh, we will be reading from lectionary. So here is um, the the third uh, lectionary reading for today, coming from the Gospel of Matthew. Now before I start reading, uh, uh, we definitely need a little context um, from this short passage. It's just one short paragraph. So what we do, or uh, where we are here, is that we find Jesus and his disciples engaged in a very, very long, and private, by the way. Jesus is not with the crowds. He's only with his disciples. It's a very long teaching session. If you have your pew Bible opened, what you will notice is that from chapter 24 until the opening chapter, or, or the opening paragraph of chapter 26, only Jesus is talking. This is not a conversation. It is not a discussion. It's not a Q&A. Jesus is talking through all of 24, all of 25, and the opening of 26, and only then does he stop. He's, uh, through this entire section, two full chapters, he's using parables and prophecy and metaphysical lessons and philosophy and things like that to, to prepare the disciples for Jesus to be gone. So he is preparing them for his departure, for what is to come next. Now, uh, this passage, especially where we pick up, and again, this is just lectionary, so I did not pick this passage. It's, it's, it's straight from lectionary. The passage that we are reading will not make any sense unless we take a look at the rest of 24. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to open your pew Bible to Matthew chapter 24, And I want you to start at the very beginning of 24, and together we are going to read the section titles. And the section titles are not part of the original Bible, kind of air quotes around that. Um, The writers of the Bible, in this case, the author of the Gospel of Matthew, did not put chapter titles in there. Uh, We added those later. But just let's look at those. 
okay, above the, the beginning of the chapter, it, it, it says the destruction of the temple foretold. The next section, signs of the end of the age. The next section, persecutions foretold. The desolating sacrilege. The coming of the Son of Man. The lesson of the fig tree. And then where we will soon be reading the necessity for watchfulness. Now, in, in all of these titles, you can see that Jesus is talking about events in the future. So, Jesus is talking about events that will be in the future. Now, before we go any further, I just want to clarify that scholars, pretty much like 100% of the scholars, even, conserv even theologically conservative scholars agree that the author of this gospel was writing sometime uh, between the years 80 to 90 CE. So the, whoever wrote this, the person who wrote this, was writing sometime between 80 and 90 CE, which is about 50 to 60 years after Jesus' death. It is also after some of these factually historic events took place, such as the destruction of the, Jerus of the, of the temple in Jerusalem. So, for instance, when it says... Um, the destruction of the temple foretold. The author has already witnessed the destruction of the temple. So please do not think that Jesus is prophesying future events like Nostradamus. He's not. But the lessons that we get to take away from the remembered words of Jesus are still important and can still be lived within us. Okay. One more comment before we jump into the reading. For the reading to make full sense to us, I want us to look at verses 29 through 31 and verses 34 through 35 before we read. So I'm going to read those. Uh, so we're still in the same chapter. And, and remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples this entire time. So they have this in their head when he says the words we're going to read for our passage. So this is just some of what he is telling the disciples. Immediately after the, after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened, almost like a solar eclipse. And the moon, even on a full moon, will not give its light. And the stars, pick, when you see the stars tonight, if it's a cloudless sky, imagine all of this. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear up in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather all of his elect people from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Now jumping down to verse 34 and then closing with 35. And he will send out his angels, oh, I'm sorry, uh, truly I tell you, down to 34, truly I tell you, and imagine his disciples, just the 12 of them, no crowds, sitting, hearing these words. Truly I tell you, Jesus says to them, this generation, you sitting around me right now here today, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, with all of that in our head, let's hear the necessity for watchfulness. But about that day and that hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, meaning Jesus himself, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and they were drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two people will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. In our own era, that would be two people would be in the grocery store together buying bread, okay? Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. I guess that means more bread for you if you were in the bread aisle. But here's the important part. Keep awake, therefore. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready For the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. At an unexpected hour. Who here enjoys surprises? Anyone enjoy um, a good surprise? Um... Perhaps your mom baked your favorite, I don't know, chocolate chip cookies or cake and just gave you a surprise. That would be a good surprise, right? Um, uh, who, uh, perhaps uh, you have recently had a birthday surprise. Uh, big, uh, maybe you're, you just turned some 60 or 70 and some friends decided to give you a big birthday surprise. That's a good surprise. Many of us would enjoy those surprises. Not all of us would enjoy a birthday surprise, but whatever. Um, uh, Another good surprise would be if you put on your winter jacket recently and you put your hand in your pocket and you happen to come out with a couple dollars, maybe even a ten dollars. Pretty good surprise. Pretty good surprise. But the surprises that I'm actually talking about that we might not enjoy are the slow surprises, which almost seems like an oxymoron or a contradiction. A slow surprise. The kind of surprises that unfold slowly incrementally over such a long period of time that by the time the future is clear, meaning the future in just a few minutes or a few weeks from now or a few months from now, by the time the future is clear, there's really nothing you can do about it because the surprise unfolded so slowly that by the time the future is here, you can't change it. Perhaps one example would be um, uh, budgeting, (laughs) household budgeting. Um, If you go, if you don't do a household budget and you get to the end of the year, you might be surprised at the end of December when you're, or January when you're doing your taxes or something like that, or you open up your checkbook. That's a slow unfolding surprise. That's not pleasant. Though it should not have been a surprise. One of the surprises um, that I think perhaps we've all had is that when I turned 21, 
It was obviously not a surprise. It was really fun and exciting. And at the age of 21, the age of 30 seemed a long, 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 long way away. Raise your hand if this seems familiar. From 21 to 30 is an eon. I don't think I will ever get there. My body is young. I can drink all night. I've got a ton of friends. Life is fantastic and great. But then eventually, I did turn 30, and I was quite surprised. It's like, well, how did I get to 30? It, it seemed like just a few months ago or years ago that I was 21, and now I'm 30. How, how did that happen? Things like that, going from 21 to 30, or 30 to 40 or 40 to 50, those happen slowly, but it's still a surprise. Another real common surprise that I think most of you have had is with your kids. In our congregation, we have families who have young kids, and we have families who have older kids. But I'm pretty sure, because this is what has been explained to me, that it seems in the middle of parenting, especially younger kids, that they will never be out of your hair. You will never have a free Friday night. You will never sleep eight full hours when the baby is really young. Your house is always going to be a mess, and you just can't wait until you're out of the house. And this will be true for those whose kids are out of the house. All of a sudden, they're graduating college and they're getting married. And you're standing next to them, and you're like, oh my God, how did how did this happen? One day I couldn't wait for you to get out of my house and now I don't want you to go. It happens slowly, but it is still a surprise. I'm going to make a, a jump from the personal turning 21 or watching your kids get older, to the, to the slightly more general but still quite specific. So in a little change from how I normally like to deliver sermons where I'm definitely just talking about your life, right now, at least in this sermon, I want to talk about our church life. Specifically, I want to talk about this church and mainline churches. Now raise your hand if you know, uh, if you've heard the definite or the phrase mainline churches. Okay. A, a general loose description of what a mainline church is are those churches that have a long history in America, in the United States of America. Those churches who were present during our founding years. So we're talking about definitely the Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, ELCA Lutheran churches, the Episcopal Church, Congregationalist churches, we know them as the UCC churches, uh, some Baptist churches as well. These are what's called mainline churches. They've been in America since its founding, since before its founding. They've, they spread across the country from coast to coast. They are your long-standing traditional churches. And today, they mostly are known to be theologically or even politically liberal. Now, I'm, I'm speaking in generalizations here, okay, but I just kind of want to give us a little context for what I'm talking about. Um, when I say theologically or even politically liberal, what I mean is um, we were some of the first churches to be okay with divorce, going back a long time ago. We were also some of the first churches to be okay with female ordination, ordaining women into into being pastors, okay? 
we were also some of the first churches to ordain gay people, LGBT, and now uh, Q and T people, trans pastors as well. We, were, uh, we tend to also be churches that believe it is okay for a woman to be able to choose if she needs to have an abortion, private conversation between her and her doctor. Today, we also tend to be, this is, this is not true for every mainline church, so I'm making generalizations here. We also tend to be the churches that are uh, uh, work for environmental causes, uh, social justice issues, um, access to health care, um, gun legislation, a range of issues. Okay. So when I say mainline churches, that's what I'm talking about. So mainline churches have also been going through a long, slow surprise. Again, it seems like a contradiction. A long, slow surprise. If you have been a member of this church for a while, it's probably easy to recognize the surprise, especially if you take a snapshot photo of church on a Sunday, first day of Advent, let's say 1985. Number one, there'd be more people here, of course. Number two, you would be kicked out, 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 I would be kicked out, and you would be kicked out, and Bill too, and Gil. Why? Ain't now one of you got a jacket and tie on. I mean that. I've looked at a lot of, oh, and also Jim back there. I've looked at a lot of pictures of this church from the 1980s, and every single male in church on a Sunday at, at, had a jacket and a shirt, and if he did not have a tie, he had a turtleneck, because it was the 70s and 80s, okay? So a turtleneck... And a, and a sports jacket. Okay. Slow, incremental changes. So, it's not a... And then if you look around right now, we have far fewer people than we would have had in 1985. Some of you might remember Rick Rom, pa, uh, Reverend Rick Rom. He was the pastor at Fargo Presbyterian Church for, I think, a good 10 years, or maybe even 15, I think, was his time over there. Uh, he is now fully retired. He has preached here in Pulpit Supply quite a number of years ago. He is fond of this anecdotal statistic. He was ordained into the clergy in the year 1975, as a young man, straight out of seminary. And he said, from the day he was ordained, PCUSA has been declining. <laughs> he says that humorously, almost as if he's taking ownership, because from the time I entered the PCUSA, he says, we have been in decline. Now, if you know your Presbyterian history, you know that PCUSA was not here in 1975. That's because we were still the northern and the southern Presbyterian churches. There was PCUS, and there was not PCUSA, it was, uh, uh, I forget. But we had a northern church and a southern Presbyterian church. That went all the way back to the Civil War. But in 1985, we merged into the PCUSA. But when... He, Rick Rom said that we have been declining since 1975 as PCUSA. He's taking Presbyterians north and south before and after the merger. And this is statistically true. Your denomination, PCUSA, hit its numbers peak in 1975 and has been going down slowly ever since. Slowly. Until there's a surprise we find ourselves where we are today. Fewer people, less money, looking at some serious changes. How do we want to run our church family? How do we want to worship on Sunday? 
What are the things we wish to spend our money on? How and how far into the future do we wish to go? On that day, none of us knows, or about that day, none of us knows. About which day? About the day, Jesus is talking about the day the Son of Man returns. But Jesus also said to his disciples on that day, this generation will not pass away until the Son of Man returns. I'm paraphrasing. What Jesus is doing is, he's, is he is bringing the future and the present and the past all together, all at once. We always must be ready for the future, no matter what it looks like. You will not know on what day any important future event will occur. Whether or not that's something as monumental as the return of the Son of Man, or as consequential as how long this church will continue to be able to be a church financially, or when your daughter will all of a sudden exert her independence from you, unless it's already happened, or the next time Peter breaks one of his swim records, which seems to be weekly, or when a parent may pass away, or when a spouse may have a stroke. or any other number of very important events in our life. About that day, not a single one of us knows. And yet Jesus is reminding his disciples that you don't have to worry about that day. You have to prepare for the day you don't have to worry for that day. None of you are preparing for a stroke or a heart attack or a car accident, but I'm pretty sure most of you have health insurance and auto insurance. So please don't worry about a heart attack or a stroke, but you're probably also doing things to make sure that if it happens, you're okay. as this sermon relates to our church. And the title of the sermon is, Are We Still Doing... No, I forgot the sermon, the title. But Are We Doing the Same Old Thing? I think that's the basic title. Are We Doing the Same Old Thing? This church and every PCUSA church in this district and the regional district and the national is wrestling with its identity, who it was, who it is right now, and who it might be in the future. The future is not guaranteed, by the way, for any PCUSA church. And this is also the case for ELCA churches and many Episcopal churches and Methodist churches and UCC churches, all of the mainline churches. We have been a part of this country since before its founding. And the future is not guaranteed to us. But we don't have to worry about that future. We can still wisely do our things today. Hanging of the greens, decorating all the the garlands around over here and putting up a Christmas tree and all the fun things and doing the countdown candles every single Sunday 
Shout out to Leander, by the way. I love that new countdown candles instead of advent wreath candles. And the same goes for your life. You don't have to worry what your future looks like. You don't even have to worry if you're going to be able to do the right thing or make the right decision in your future because God will be with you and Jesus is there for you. You don't have to worry about the future because God is with you now no matter what happens. Amen. Let us pray. Before we go into our song, let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you enter our hearts the rest of today and the week and really, really remind us that we do not have to worry. Even as we let go of some things of our old life, We know that you will be there to give us new things for whatever our new life looks like, whatever that future looks like. We know that you will be with us, and we ask that we truly are comforted by your continual and eternal presence individually with each of us. Amen.
any prayer requests out there, verbally or written on a prayer card? Any verbal prayer requests? Let us all pray. The weight of so many concerns are upon our shoulders, dear Heavenly Father. Private little things in each of our heads, clouding our thinking, darkening our heart. The passage of time, the decline of our physical body, Ailments, disease, medical tests coming up. Dying. At the same time that so many of us might be worried about one part of life, there's joys at the same time, new babies, New birthdays, new relationships, new jobs, new ideas popping up in our head. We bounce from one extreme to the other so frequently. Two people side by side, one joyful, one sad. It's why we come to church, God. All of us coming together, so many emotions swirling around, we know that only you can deal with such diversity. If we are happy, God, we ask that we can share the sadness of someone else in this space right now. We ask that you allow us to feel that sadness. If we are sad, but someone else sitting four pews away is happy, dear God, we ask that we can also feel that joy, reminding us that it will get better. In this moment of silence, we ask that you hear our little tiny silent prayers that go up. It might be one prayer from one person or ten little prayers from one person. Please hear each and every one. And taking a deep breath, we all say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise.
Don't be surprised if God does something in your life this week, because God is doing something every week. Amen.